This is episode 111 of the Secret Library Podcast. My guest this week is the novelist Keith Gesson. So before we get to Keith, I wanted to share a couple of small announcements. One is that after a lot of debate and deliberation, we have decided we're going back to one guest per episode. And that's for a couple of reasons. One is that as tricky as it is to schedule one guest, it is somehow twice or three times as tricky to schedule to have more than one guest reported uh, per week. So that's one issue. And the other one is just the episodes were getting really long and I didn't like having to be so conscious of the time and making sure that the conversations were short so that they would fit with a second guest. So I think in service to making the conversation more meaningful and being able to go a bit deeper with the guests, I kept it at one guest per episode. In addition, we would love to have you be part of the conversation. And the way that you can do that is connect with me on Twitter. First of all, I'm there a lot and I'm at Carol Donahue. And you can also check in on the Facebook page for the show or if you'd like to be a part of a conversation with a community that's really kind of guiding and advising and sharing more input, you can support the show on Patreon. And that can be found at patreon.com slash secret library. And that's our listener support for the show. So let's get on to the interview. Keith Gesson is the author of the novel A Terrible Country, as well as the book All the Sad Young Literary Men. He's also a founding editor of N Plus One, and he is the editor of three nonfiction books and the translator from Russian of Nobel Prize winner Svetlana Alexeyevich's Voices from Chernobyl. A contributor to The New Yorker and the London Review of Books, Gesson teaches journalism at Columbia and lives in New York with his wife and son. So I really enjoyed speaking to Keith because... I very much enjoyed A Terrible Country, and I think he was so open and thoughtful and honest about the fears that come up when writing a book and how you can have one intention for a book, really work hard on writing that book, and then realize partway through the process that what needs to happen is a very, very different book. So for anyone who has had concerns, had mid draft or even mid-novel redirections that happen, or just fears that the book is never, ever going to be written, I offer you this conversation with Keith Gesson to encourage you to keep going and to see that even when you're beset with doubts, you can still feel positive about the experience and want to write another book at the end. So I think this is a great episode to listen to for in in favor of pulling through, in favor of sticking it out, and in, in favor of being willing to change and also staying dedicated to the book all the way through. So here we go with Keith Gesson. Hey, Keith, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. So I'm really excited to talk about A Terrible Country. Um, it was very interesting to read as we were wrapping up the TV show, The Americans. I felt like this whole, like I'm in, like immersed in Russia and the impact of Russia and the Soviet Union. And I feel like it's something we're thinking a lot, a lot about right now, but it was such a human story. I'm wondering how it is to write about Russia in a time that it's so charged. Mm. I mean, you know, I've been writing about Russia um, since the sort of mid 90s. So I've gone through and re I mean, really, I kind of started, you know, I graduated school in 98 and then I kind of started out as a freelancer and um, kind of found myself uh, gravitating toward Russia stuff. Um, and and by then, uh, Russia had kind of collapsed. Mm -hmm. And so um, most of my career as a kind of writer about Russia has been um, trying to get people to be interested in something they weren't actually interested in. Um, and people were still interested in, you know, Russian literature. So that was you know, um, I did a lot of writing about that. Um, but in terms of sort of going over to Russia and, and kind of doing reported stuff, there was a very long fallow period of disinterest, which comprises most of my career. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, and, and in fact, when I started this book, it was so I started in 2009, I started writing it. Um, and it didn't, you know, I was like, okay, uh, here I've been kind of selling these stories little by little about Russia, 
um, it's been pretty hard. Maybe um, a whole novel about Russia will do better or not. I mean, I, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't think of it really as a kind of commercial proposition. I just kind of thought, well, okay, here's what I need to write now and we'll see how it goes. And then um, kind of, it took me much longer to write than I anticipated. And obviously in, in 2014, Russia invaded Ukraine. Um, and there was this kind of explosion of interest in in Russia, in Putin, what's going on over there. Um, and I was still writing my novel and I thought, oh no, here's, <laughs> you know, I had, here's like my opportunity to, to publish something, um, about, you know, to publish my novel basically. And I'm still not done. <laughs> and I, um, I was very sad. Um, and I thought my kind of my, my chance had passed, but lucky for me, <laughs> um, you know, the Russians hacked the election. Good job, and, Russians. Yeah, good job. Yeah, you can, you know, you can kind of... Keep my Russians. book. Keep yeah. my book on the forefront of everyone's um, mind. So, uh, yeah, I, you know, my, I keep thinking, um, yeah, people are, you know, for the moment, people are still interested in Russia, but, but if, uh, like, if Trump fires Mueller in the next uh, few weeks, that'll be, that'll be bad. For my yeah, that my would book. Be a bad oh, well. <laughs> and and our country. And our country. Yes. And our country also. <laughs> well, I think it's fair to focus on the book at this point when the book is coming out. I think that's completely reasonable. Yeah. But the other so, thing too is that I mean, while Russia is significant enough in the book that it's almost like its own character that Andre is interacting with, I think that it's also fundamentally a, a story about sort of intergenerational intergenerational relationships and responsibility and what does it mean to graduate school and not know what you're quite going to do next um which i think is sort of timeless oh yeah i hope so i hope so yeah i mean uh, you know i sort of my my first novel was about was about these sort of young men who were kind of aimless graduate students or freelance writers in their 20s and, you know, basically kind of stuck in graduate school or kind of New York. Um, and, you know, then I, um, as the book describes, um, this is, you know, based on, this part of the book is based on my personal experience where I went over to Moscow to take care of my grandmother. And um, I had been writing as a journalist about Russia for many years, but I, I never thought I would be able to write a novel. Um, but then I was, you know, I spent this year there with my grandmother and it was a very intense and, and kind of, diff, you know, at times very difficult experience. Um, and when I came home from it, I thought, oh, well, okay, that's, that's something worth trying to write down. Um, and, and, and so, you know, and I, so, so I guess Russia in, 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 in that context, it was kind of an accident that it had taken place in mm -hmm. Russia. Um, but for me, it was kind of a, a happy accident in the sense of that I kind of had all this stuff about Russia that I had been thinking and trying to write down for a very long time. And I thought, oh, I could try to kind of jam it into this book. Um, and I mean, in fact, the kind of one of the reasons it took so long to write was that I had this idea that it would be this kind of, you know, you, you would have this sort of narrative about this uh, guy who takes care of his grandmother, but there would be these long um, essays about history and literature kind of intertwined with that. Right. Um, and it would be this kind of 1,000 page book and, you know, the only book about Russia that you would ever need to read. No pressure. Because it would contain, yeah, it would contain all knowledge about Russia that has ever been, um, you know. Oh my God, no wonder. I'm surprised you're not still <laughs> writing. That is terrifying. Well, no, well, I did I did write a kind of version of that. Um, and I, I, had, I got one of these... Um, fellowships at the New York Public Library for a year. Amazing. Um, well, it was, yes, I mean, it, and it was, it was wonderful because um, I'm, I'm a person who, I, I'm sure all writers do this, but I feel like I do this, you know, m m uh, more, <laughs> um, <laughs> which is I have this idea in my mind, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just walking around with these ideas in my mind. I'm like, oh, I'm going to write this thing and it's going to be so amazing. And I just need to do this bit of research, 
um, in order to write this amazing thing and I just need to get to the library and you know sit down for a couple of weeks and and I will emerge at the other end of it with this um, work of, of genius um, and but then I you know I don't get, I don't have time I have stuff to do blah 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 and I don't get to the library and so this kind of um, this expression and manifestation of my genius gets, you know, put off. <laughs> right. <laughs> kind of, so you're like, oh no, it's too bad. Well, yeah, and and but I still have, you know, I'm like, oh, as as soon as I get to the library, this this is going to happen for me. Um, <laughs> and uh, so the wonderful thing, the kind of wonderful slash horrible thing about um, having a year at the library was there was. I just had to go and I just had to actually do this thing that I had been kind of imagining myself doing. Um, and it's, a, you know, it's this amazing fellowship where you, you have to literally go to the library every day, every weekday. It's like, you know, nine to five. And then you sit there in a little office and you have access. Oh, to you're the, not even in that big room upstairs. No, there's a little special, it's called the Cullman Center for Writers and Scholars. And you get a little office kind of off the main room there and everybody's sitting in their little offices um, and you have access to the entire New York Public Library catalog which is you know one of the largest uh, collections in the world um, and you can order any book you don't have to get up from your computer you order it on the computer and it shows up either later that day or the next morning what? if it's if if it's in new jersey like a lot of their books are now stored in new jersey um if you order it by like three o'clock or by noon i can't remember um you literally get it the next morning it just shows up um so it was you know so i would be like oh i want to have this essay in here about uh, the history of russian oil right mm -hmm. and the next day i have seven you know, books in Russian and English about the history of Russian oil. And, you know, I can start reading them. So it was a kind of mixture of getting those books and seeing that there wasn't, um, you know, all the knowledge that I had mad imagined would be in those books was not actually there. And I had right. to make it up or, you know, I was on my own. Or it was there and I, you know, and then I would do the reading and then I would write the essay. And so basically at the end of this year at the library, I had this draft, which was, you know, I don't know, 500, 600 pages of this kind of, the, you know, somewhat resembling the, the narrative that is still in the book, uh, plus all these essays. And I sat down and read it. I was kind of excited. I printed it out. <laughs> and um, I just spent a week, you know, I mean, I, I basically read it, but it was, un it was impossible to read. Oh, no. It, like no human including myself, um, could actually read this book. It was too boring. Um, so that was a, a valuable lesson <laughs> for oh, me. Man. And and I had to, you know, I basically, you know, started either cutting those essays out or like reducing them to, you know, first uh, a page, then a couple of paragraphs, then basically a line or two here and there. Um, I don't know what uh, that question that I was answering there, but, but that's the kind of story of of how I wrote the book, and then once I once I'd done that, and I'm very glad I did that because I learned that my concept, my kind of initial conception, was dumb, um, <laughs> or at least or at least kind of not something that I could pull off. Um, and it was really good to know that, um, and to you know to to really definitively learn that. Um, well, it's like a foundational shift. It's like, okay, I have this concept of what the perfect book is going to look like and realizing that like, oh, maybe maybe I don't need to hold myself to that conception that it might work better a different way. Yeah, well, but you know, you have to, it's, I mean, but you have to actually sit down and do it to, to find out, right? Otherwise, exactly. I mean, if you're me, you will literally walk around for years with this idea in your head that if you just, you know, if... X and Y kind of factors in your life uh, can come together. You'll you'll do this, and then um, so it's good to to learn that. And then the next basically two years were spent um, cutting all that stuff out, and then you know trying to figure out how to how to kind of salvage this um, book and 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 you know turning it into a much more basically kind of traditional novel, um, which I'm ultimately much kind of happier with. Well, that's good. <laughs> I I found it in, I found it really engaging and that it really moved along. I mean, I think the knowing that things are kind of going downhill with the grandmother that she has this 
you know, difficulty of holding on to her memories and, and the sort of heartbreaking moments when she doesn't know who her grandson is and he has to kind of remind her of what their relationship is. Um, I mean, you, you kind of know where that's going, but you don't know where everything around it is going, which I think is an interesting way to create tension, like putting something that's a plot line you can kind of see into the future versus one that you can't. Mm-hmm. Yes, thank you. Um, I mean, you know, it's, it's weird. You, you kind of, you know, you write one book and at the end of that book, you're like, oh, I've kind of learned how to write this book. Um, and, you, and you think, you kind of secretly think to yourself, well, I've learned how to write books. <laughs> right. um, but it turns out, um, at least so far in my experience, that, that you actually only learned to write that one book. Um, and then you need to, when you write a new book, you need to figure out how to write that new book. And it's a completely different kind of process. Um, and it yeah, it's profoundly unfair that that is. <laughs> right. I mean, you, when you're a doctor and you learn how to cut out someone's, you know, appendix, right. Then you know it. I don't know. There may be some curveballs in there too, but I've never attempted an appendix. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, it certainly takes a lot longer to write a novel. Yes. For sure. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, so yeah, so the the uh, right the the kind of storyline with the grandmother that was always there, and and you're right that it was always kind of going to end um, pretty much in the way that it, you know it's going to end, um, and it was a question of putting in um, slightly smaller storylines um, that would kind of pull you through the thing and and some of them you know some of them as small as the one that I that kind of took me the longest to figure out even though it's kind of dumb was you know I really wanted him to to uh go out and describe the neighborhood that they live in right so mm-hmm. he, he moves in with his grandmother and 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 kind of Moscow is these um it's this you know, like any city, it's got these kind of neighborhoods and, and they're all, they all have slightly different characters. Um, in Moscow, everything, you have all these kind of, yeah, you have all these micro neighborhoods. They're all quite different, they, um, but, but they're all somewhat in relation to the kind of center of Moscow, which is the Kremlin. Um, and next to it is um, the old KGB headquarters. Right. And um, so, you know, I, I, uh, I needed to establish kind of where they were, right, and describe the neighborhood. That was my uh, goal in, yes. in, in one of the early chapters. And I kept, you know, having the narrator kind of go out and, you know, describe the neighborhood, but it was boring. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I was like, why is this so boring? To, to me, it's, as a person, it's so interesting. Um, why, as a reader, do I find it difficult to kind of read this chapter, no matter how many times I kind of make it shorter and shorter? Um, and then it, you know, it, it turned out I you just needed to kind of give him a reason for for leaving the house. <laughs> you know, right. even even though as a kind of as a person who arrives in a new place, right? You you actually don't need a reason to leave the house. You you leave the house to go look around. Right, it's a perfectly natural thing for a person arriving in a place to do. You just kind of go walk around, see what's in the neighborhood. Um, whereas for a fictional character, annoyingly, <laughs> um, they have to actually—they um, don't have to, but ideally, they would have some kind of mission that they're going on. Um, and uh, basically, you know, the mission turns out that he needs to find a place to check his email so he can see if his grandmother is taking the right medicine. Um, you know, and that was a kind of, uh, I don't know, that, not, not quite a revelation, but I was like, oh, you know, uh, e- each of these little mini episodes uh, in the book that are necessary for various kind of um, larger reasons need, need to have um, these little kind of mini motivations um, to propel the reader. Yeah, it's sort of like you have these sneaky reasons like the real reason we're doing this and yet the reader won't know right um and it's i mean it's i guess it's a trick (laughs) um but 
you know, I, it's a trick that I, as a kind of reader, appreciate. Um, yeah. And, you know, the one kind of, I feel like the one advantage or the one kind of skill uh, that I have as a writer is that as a reader, I have a very um, low boredom threshold. <laughs> um, like I get bored very easily. And um, so when I'm reading my own stuff, I, I also get bored very easily. <laughs> um, and so when I'm kind of going through something I've written, I, I you know, I'm, I'm very sensitive to it being boring. Um, yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and, and one way to keep stuff from, from um, not being boring uh, is, is to have, you know, a, a kind of logic to the stuff that's happening and a kind of motivation or reason for it. Uh, happening. So I was curious about given that you, you mentioned that you did spend a year in Russia taking care of your your grandmother in Moscow. I was wondering how real Dima was. Oh, because um, how much is happening in fiction? Because there's in the choice to make the book a novel rather than a memoir, you know, you have such permission to kind of go off and, and bring these characters in however you'd like. So how much you know how much fun were you able to have kind of changing these characters and expanding on your own experience yeah i mean uh, you know the the honest answer to that is that the grandmother is a you know that's pretty much my grandmother and you know i changed some biographical kind of details you know sort of um just to make it make sense um because people's actual lives don't always make sense. <laughs> no, it's true. Uh, and, and or or you know I didn't quite know all the information. Right. Um, actually, this is not in the book. But one one thing that my um, grandmother would do, uh, somewhat kind of you know very frustratingly, um, but but uh, also kind of very movingly, which, you know I would, I would hear her on the phone talking with her friends. Um, about me and um, she would th there was just a lot of stuff that either she didn't know or she had forgotten oh. and she would just make it up <laughs> oh. right and she would you know like at one point I, I came home and she you know um, she was talking about how I lived in California oh. um, and you know and some stuff was kind of and she was like and his life isn't very, he's not doing very well. Oh. <laughs> he hasn't figured out what to do with his life. <laughs> and, um, you know, and it was just, so there would be these kind of like, um, uh, you know, um, deeper truths, like, sure, I hadn't totally figured out what to do with my life, right? Um, and I, and I, I don't think she entirely understood what I did for a living. Right. You know, and... Um, but then stuff she had forgotten and just kind of filled in um, by making, you know, I, I've never lived in California, right? Um, right. But she just, you know, she was like, well, he lives in America. I can't quite remember where he lives. Presumably he lives in California. It was, you know, and, and so then I would have these kind of discussions with, and some of the stuff was more about like my personal life, which she knew a little bit about, but then would kind of fill in stuff. Um it's almost like she was writing a novel about you. Yes. <laughs> and then, you know, but, but, but by the same time, but like, you know, that's how kind of, that's how, you know, s sort of fiction works, right? Like you, or, or like, you know, in this case, how it worked for me, where I, I, there was, you know, I knew a lot about my grandmother, but there was things I didn't know. And, and that gave me a kind of opportunity to, to rewrite it as, um, you know, as, as I thought it, it would work within the novel, but, but beyond that, everybody's um, pretty made up, <laughs> and um, and it's interesting because you know I'm not. I'm definitely I definitely feel um, pretty um, uncomfortable when I get, uh, and that's kind of the best word for it. I feel you know when I'm getting away from the kind of source material, I become a little uncomfortable <laughs> as a right. writer. Yeah, and I, I kind of had to work through that in this book, right? I was because, I mean, you know, because I and I get uncomfortable because I'm like, well, here's what actually happened, right? And yeah. what actually happened is true, <laughs> and I want my book to be true, like I want it to be true to to the world, 
Um, and yet, if you just kind of wrote down the stuff that actually happened, it it wouldn't really it wouldn't be a story, right? It wouldn't make sense. It wouldn't, especially if you you know, especially if you're com confined to a kind of period of time, right? Yeah. Like over the course of decades, I think things would you know any kind of actual biographical life story would make a certain amount of sense. But if you're kind of you know working with a uh, finite discrete chunk of time in this case a year right there would be so much stuff in the book that didn't make sense um that you end up having to make you kind of have to make stuff up yeah that was that was hard for me <laughs> yeah. so um at, but at a certain point you know at a, and so so with the um you know i do have an older sibling mm -hmm. so i kind of know what an older you know sibling relationship can feel like but you know, the relationship that's described in there is not really our relationship. The person is definitely not my older sibling. Um, and so it was kind of a matter of saying, okay, here's, here's this character. Here's what makes sense um, for this character to be in the context of this book. And now here's a situation in which the character is, what would the character say in that situation? Mm -hmm. Right. And that's where you and that is kind of fun, actually. <laughs> um, I don't know. You know, people are always talking about how their characters talk to them. Mm -hmm. And I've always found that very strange. I mean, it is a little creepy. sounding. But <laughs> I mean, it's like, really, what are you doing all day? They're just sitting around. Are they are they hovering? Is it like, you know, a beautiful mind or something? You know, how is this happening? Yeah, I, I just, you know, I don't know. I, I thought I always thought it was a kind of. Um, either a fiction or, or actually, you know, there are these people who, whose minds work like this, right? And mine just doesn't. Um, but when I was writing some of these characters who, I was like, well, it, it felt to me more like of a, a kind of logic problem. Mm -hmm. um, like, you know, given, given the situation, what would this character say? And then you try, so you just kind of try stuff out. Um, and I don't know. I've been watching uh, Westworld, mm -hmm. right? And um, you know that the show, for all its flaws, you know, does have a lot to say about sort of narrative, right? And and what a kind of what a character is. Um, and you know, with sort of with Dima, you're like, okay, the, that's the older brother, right? The yep. you know, you're like. Um, you dial up the aggression, <laughs> right? You take a person and you, you know, you you increase the aggression and you kind of lower the empathy. <laughs> yeah, the opportunism is also dialed up. It's like, how am I gonna, how am I gonna make this work out for me? Right. Um, and you know, and then you know, so then what? Then what does that character do in that situation, given those kind of parameters? Um, and that is that is kind of fun. It's not quite the character, you know, talking to you, <laughs> or at least not to me. That's not what it felt like, but. Um, it did feel like I could write some stuff down and then see if it was interesting or funny, you know, and sometimes it was. I think that's fascinating, too, is just I wonder if writing all of those essays and sort of making, you know, shooting for like, I don't know if you've read A Suitable Boy by Vikram Seth. Do you know that book? No, no. It is basically the book you were describing earlier of huh. like a narrative with giant essays about <laughs> culture wow. that's a thousand pages long, but oh, it's huh. about India. Okay. I was like, oh, you're writing a suitable boy, but about Russia. Um, but those essays are real dense. But, uh -huh. um, but I, I mean, it's a great book, but it weighs about 400 pounds. Um, but I wonder if writing those essays about the culture was almost a way to kind of occupy your critical mind so that you could be chewing on that while the character development was kind of happening. And it's like, okay, as long as I'm obsessed with like researching about oil, then I'm not going to be too worried about... Am I doing this right with Dima until later when you're ready to look at it? Huh. Um, I, that's a wonderful account. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think realistically, um, no. <laughs> I mean, I, I, th I think actually, you know, actually that stuff just took a really long time and and um, I had to do it because I, I thought it was a good idea. But, you know, the, you know, the kind of the work of the character development mostly happened once I had discarded that notion, you know, and Got then it. went and kind of, um, 
you know, I mean, and, and, you know, like, for example, like Zima, like this, there's there, the other kind of thing that bloated the book at earlier stages was the, were these kind of incredibly long explanations of stuff, right? And, and it, it's something, you know, I, I really wanted the book to feel like a memoir, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I kind of, right, that's the, when you're in the first person, that's the conceit, right? Right. Um, the person, you know, Catcher in the Rye, right? That's, he's just, Holden is just kind of telling you what happened. Like it's Holden's memoir. You know, so I, on the one hand, I wanted to feel like a memoir. On the other hand, I was making stuff up, right? So um, I had this impulse to write these kind of long explanations um, for Dima, for the kind of narrator, for Andre and his parents, right? There were these kind of very long accounts of, what it was like to be immigrants in um, Boston, and and um, you know some of that stuff is still in there, but it you know when I was editing it, I was like, oh, you know, if you were actually writing your memoir, um, you wouldn't actually feel the need to explain stuff at such length. It's only when you're lying <laughs> right? um, that you go into these long explanations um because you're lying um whereas when you're when you're telling the truth you're like well here's you know here's pretty here's basically what happened um and it's much simpler right i mean so memoirs tend to be not that long right um anyway so yeah so um uh you know writing those essays i uh, writing writing the, those long explanations of the characters that was helpful to me right i mean i ended up cutting them down significantly but kind of knowing that stuff or kind of working through that stuff and thinking about it helped me um then kind of write those characters uh in a in a more succinct fashion um and, and understand what what i thought they were motivated by i guess yeah i mean i think there is this pressure like everything i write is it going to end up in the book and, and that writing that ends up in the book is somehow more valuable than this other writing. But it, I, I think it all has to happen in order for the book to be what it is. It's almost like scaffolding, that it holds it up as it's constructed. And then when you have it constructed, you can take it away. And then the book that remains is stronger for it. He, I, he, uh, again, I mean, yes, certainly that's... It doesn't feel great while it it's happening. It feels horrible. It, <laughs> it's so horrible. No, I mean, um, oh, it's... And you wish, you know, I, I don't know, I imagine some people, you know, um, don't have to do that. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I, I mean, I it know. seems like it's it's just part of the deal and that it always feels horrible. And it's like, am I doing this wrong? My God, I've had to cut this out. It's like cutting off my arm. Um, I worked so hard on this. But and I think it's probably also the logic of looking backwards. You know, it's like you look at a resume and you're like, oh, my God, what have I been doing for five years? But but I can make a narrative out of it after the fact. Mm -hmm. um, I think there is something to that writing a novel that there's like, OK, I tried all of these things. And yet here's this book that resulted. That's great. Yeah, I was I know. I mean, it's, you know, when I was in the middle of this. Right. So I, it basically took eight years to write, which is a very depressingly long period of time um i basically felt like i was like i never want to i never want to do this again it's too horrible i had a i had a really terrible moment it must have been at the end of that year at the library where i had spent a day you know working on a scene kind of writing a scene and then i was going through my notebooks um just i think Emily, my wife, had been like, you have to clean up this mess <laughs> in the, um, you know, in this, my, my kind of quasi office became the nursery. So at a certain point, I had to kind of clear out of the office um, to make room for our baby. And, uh, you know, I, I was, you know, just kind of moving my notebooks over to, you know, uh, under the bed or something, but I was looking through them. And I found in one of these notebooks, I found the exact same scene um, that I'd been writing that day, basically written pretty much in the exact same way. And I, you know, from three years earlier. Mm -hmm. So I'd, I'd written the scene, 
then I'd forgotten that I'd written it and then I was writing it again um and I was like oh this is you know like the book is going to eat itself (laughs) (laughs) um and this is horrible right I have to get out of this you know um cave that I live in um but but then you know but then toward the end um you know, as I was kind of finishing, I was like, oh, that wasn't so bad. <laughs> I could do I that again. any <laughs> large project is like that. I mean, it's just like, there is this process, like I talking to Madeline Miller, who wrote Circe, she said, you know, there's like five years of attempting things. And then I go into the trench of despair. And then it sort of resolves itself. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, but it's, it's very depressing. I, I had a, I was talking about this with a, a friend of mine who's a a novelist has written i guess six novels and they're very very charming um you know uh, they're not light but they they've written with a light touch um Mm -hmm. and uh and i was like well it must not be like this for you right um you know i i felt like i was in such hell when i was writing this book like and and you you've you've figured it out right and he said no (laughs) it is it is always hell (laughs) and i was like oh geez you know gosh (laughs) that's that's uh that's depressing but now you've gotten to the end of it you've got this book you've gotten it excerpted in the new yorker you know this is by all kind of objective standards a, a success so how do you feel at this point about writing another one or does that make you want to throw up a little bit as I even bring it up? Oh, I mean, um, uh, no, I would, I would love if, you know, if they let me, (laughs) right. I mean, it's, uh, um, yeah. I mean, I feel, you know, I, I, the book hasn't come out yet and it's, uh, it's scary. I had forgotten how scary it was. Right. You know, um, and you know how scary how you know when my first book came out i was 33 that's 10 years ago and uh i was very excited um and i uh i thought it would uh, change my life and i remember i remember quite clearly i I remember thinking well like you know i I really can't make plans beyond (laughs) beyond april (laughs) when my book comes out because who knows right um, who knows what, what, uh, magical transformations will take place in my life. Um, and now I know that that is not what happens, <laughs> um, for most people. Right. And I, I certainly don't expect it to happen for me, um, you know, this time. And, and, uh, so, um, and, you know, and then there's just, and there's kind of a certain amount of embarrassment that attends, I think, you know, this time I feel a certain embarrassment to like taking up people's time (laughs) and attention, you know, however much attention it gets, I just feel embarrassed by it. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, so I'm looking forward to getting through that. Um, but yeah, the, the actual kind of prospect of actually sitting down and doing it again, what is, is, uh, it feels much better than, um, the way I feel now, yeah, which is anxious and embarrassed. Of course. I mean, I think it's, you know, you've spent all of this time on this thing and now people are going to, you know, get their mitts on it and how are they going to respond? Right. And some people are, they're just going to hate it. And, uh, and I'm sure they'll be right. (laughs) You know, and I'm sure they'll find kind of all the things that are wrong with it that are in fact wrong. (laughs) Um, and, uh, you know, and then some people like it, but, but probably, mm, you know, for the wrong reasons. <laughs> um, yeah, it's interesting. It's an interesting, uh, it's, uh, it's interesting to pub- publish a book at 33 and then another one at 43. It's a very different feeling. Yeah. Well, it remains to be seen how it will go, but I have a feeling it's going to go well. Thank you. That's very nice of you to say. Well, thank you so much for coming on and talking about the process of of writing it and all it took to get there. I think that will be of enormous comfort to everybody listening who is saying, my God, why is this taking so long? And why is it so hard? Hearing that they're not alone, I think, is 
one of the things that most people love most hearing from people who have published books, that there isn't some sort of magical fairy dust that they found in the closet and everything just happened and it was so easy. Yeah. But I, yeah, maybe you should cut that part out about how I, how badly I feel on the eve of the <laughs> book's publication. <laughs> That's not very inspiring, but, um, but, but, you know, I feel, um, yeah, I, I'm probably not the only one who feels this way when their book. Is no, I know for certain you're not. Well, I wish you so much luck and congratulations on the book. And thank Thank you you. so much. Thanks. Nice to talk to you. Thank you so much for listening to the Secret Library podcast. We hope you've enjoyed this week's show. You can keep the conversation going by leaving a comment in the show notes at secretlibrarypodcast.com or visit us on Facebook at facebook.com slash secretlibrarypodcast. You can also connect directly with me on Twitter or Instagram where I'm Caro Donahue. That's at... C-A-R-O-D-O-N-A-H-U-E. I look forward to chatting with you there. See you next week. Until then, happy writing.